Hi, I'm Norm, and welcome to the Shotokan Chronicles. In today's video, we're going to go back to the Nakayama Legacy series and look at the second kata in the Shotokan Karate Kata syllabus, Heian Niden. But first, be sure to subscribe to the channel and ring the notification bell so you don't miss out on any of our future video content. So I'm going to watch the video here with you and I'm going to try to give some of my commentary on some of the, the important points of the kata as well. I hope I don't interfere with Nakayama's commentary and um, speak over him while uh, he includes some of his thoughts on the important details of the kata. So without any further ado, Heian Nida. Here we'll learn to master Haimen Sokumen Jodan Uke, Yoko Geri, Uraken Doji Kogeki, and Mae Geri. Heian Nidan. Now, so many people have um, performed back stance incorrectly, and it's key to make sure your shoulder hip and knee are in a straight line. If they're out far and your stance is more like a horse stance, that's incorrect. The older masters, and you're going to see that perform the older way here. Um, it actually causes injury to the knees. So it's better to have everything stacked one above the other. And this, this JKA Master is one of my favorites. I love watching him perform. Osaka Sensei. Notice here the half step. Make sure you're not bringing your foot all the way up so they're together. You only want to bring your foot up to create a center axis point for your turn and your back and your side thrust kick. Or side snap kick. Sorry. Let's watch the film. See how he's almost stacked there. He should be over just a little bit more on his stance. In Sokume and Uke, you trick with your body facing front without twisting your knees. Usually, you trick in two movements, but as you progress, you'll be able to do it in one by pulling and pushing your legs and tricking Uraken Yoko Geri simultaneously. There are 26 movements in all. And that part is pretty easy for beginners because it was included in Heian Chonen. Fully bend and set your back knee. Use this leg as an axis. Take care not to change the height of your waist. And always be sure to use two hands when you're doing those techniques. When you perform a trick in Gyaku Hamni stance, turn your hip fully using your back leg as an axis so that your upper body will turn half side. Now this downward block, the stance, the feet should be on the same line. You're actually blocking on the angle, but looking straight ahead. If you master this kata, 
and make use of the basic tricks included in it, your fighting actions such as Basai will be perfected. Master Tanaka, I wish... Let's watch the entire course of action again. I wish I had the opportunity to train with you. Notice some of them are doing up here. It should only be like Agiyuki rising block above your head. It's creating like a box shape. Do this block. It's only gonna stop here. Instructor Nakayama explains the points of action. This Sokumen Uke is seen in karate very often. In this case, you defend, making your forearm erect from the elbow. All movement should remain in one plane. Whether you make a fist or an open hand, the position of the elbow doesn't change. Very important. This action is seen in many kata. Its purpose is to change direction and attempt the trick without changing the position of your upper body. So take a short step forward and make an axis line from your head to your toe. Change direction by turning your hips and then kick. So many people overstep and bring their feet right together, only to that center line point. The Hamni stance of the 16th to 19th movements is called Gyaku Hamni. It differs from the usual Hamni stance in that the back foot side of the hip is moved forward and you make a trick. In the 19th movement, you turn your hip quickly enough for your forefoot to be pulled back naturally. Another key thing. Now, like uh, any bunkai that's going to be introduced here, you want to remember that it is basic. The bunkai that you should perform for tournament, you can change. Or the bunkai, if you're thinking about practical application, you can change. Bunkai, remember, means the whole kata, not just segments. And if you're performing this for a turn or for a grading, make sure you perform the traditional bunkai for your organization. There are effective techniques here, but there are techniques that would only work against another martial artist. When you do the transition from here to here, make sure you're not moving your feet. You're only shifting the weight of your stance.
Now, these kata videos are classics. Nakayama's Legacy is probably one of the most important video series that the JKA um, put out in the 60s, 70s time frame. You have to remember when you're looking at these videos that they are not current. They are not today's um, versions of the kata. And some organizations have made some changes. Whether it's for scientific reasons, how the body works, or for the head of the organization or the sensei that's teaching it might have tweaks depending on how they perform the kata themselves. You need to remember that some instructors are going to change things but not always for the better. And when you're thinking about bunkai, as I've always said, bunkai is the entire kata turned into application. Bunkai of a kata is traditionally linked to the movements and directions of the kata with a minor change. If you're talking about the bunkai that so many people discuss where they just take a portion of the kata, cut it away, pull it out of context, that is called oyo. And there's a lot of techniques from this kata that can be can be sliced up and diced up into really cool oyo. That's the thing with kata, they were designed as a toolbox to a different fighting system. And by using this kata specifically, there are some great techniques that'll work. Now, I read one time that one of the original concepts for this technique was grabbing a samurai by the horns of his helmet and twisting to break his neck. That is very, very impractical and improbable that it would work. If you grabbed a samurai by his helmet, his helmet's not strapped on like helmets today in sports. They're not tight to the head. Samurai helmets were tied on with a piece of cord and if you twisted that it would just roll the cord up over my up over the chin and it would be removed. In some cases samurais had a faceplate as well which in that situation they might have been able to have a tighter grip of the helmet on their head. However, if I reached up and grab a samurai by the head, by the horns on his helmet, I think he's going to cut me down. He carries so many blades on him, I do believe that I'd be in trouble. So if you read that and that's what you believe as being factual, I highly doubt it. Thanks for watching. Train hard. Be sure to like, comment, share, and subscribe. And I'll see you next time right here on the Shortacan Chronicles.